So, this is the most widely used anti-tank weapon in the world. For over 60 years since its introduction, it is still killing the most modern tanks on the battlefield, with a pretty dark history behind it. The RPG-7 makes people wonder if tanks really have a future at all. But why did this happen, and where did its story actually begin? You might be surprised to hear it goes all the way back to 1931, starting as an experimental shoulder-launched anti-tank weapon called the RS-65. But this early version didn't have a shaped charge warhead, so it didn't work out. The real influence came later, first from the American bazooka and then from the German Panzerfaust during World War II. To give you a quick rundown, the Americans were the first to come up with the idea of a rocket-propelled shaped charge warhead fired from a shoulder launcher. Then, early in the war, the Germans got their hands on some captured bazookas and decided they could do it better. That's when they came up with the Panzerschreck, which by the way literally means tank terror. It was much more powerful than the American bazooka, with a bigger warhead that could punch through up to 200 millimeters of armor, which was insane for that time. But it needed a crew and some serious training, so the Germans went on to create something cheaper, lighter, and easy enough for anyone to use. That led to the Panzerfaust, or Armor Fist, in that typical straightforward German style. It was a one-shot disposable anti-tank weapon that could take on pretty much any tank in the world back then. However, the first Panzerfaust had issues with range and accuracy, around 30 meters effective at best. Later versions fixed that with stronger warheads and better range. They even planned an upgraded version called the Panzerfaust 250, but they never had time to build it before the war ended. The Soviets, meanwhile, didn't have anything like that during the war. They mostly relied on anti-tank rifles and cannons. When the war ended, they finally had time to look at what the Germans and Americans had done with rocket launchers. They didn't copy anyone directly, but instead took the best ideas from all sides and tried to combine them. That led to the RPG-1. It had a one meter long launch tube, an angled pistol grip, and a wooden cover to protect the shooter from heat, and it basically set the shape of what would later become the RPG-7. But the RPG-1 had all kinds of problems with range, accuracy, and reliability, so they scrapped it and started again. The next version, the RPG-2, fixed most of those problems. It had a better warhead and longer range, and it was accepted into service in 1954 with both Soviet and Chinese forces. It used a larger propellant charge and fired an 80mm heat round, giving it a range of about 200 meters and armor penetration around 225mm. It saw its first real combat in Vietnam, where American troops quickly learned to fear it. It could easily blow through the light aluminum armor of an M113 armored personnel carrier, take down helicopters, and even tanks like the M48 and M60 Pattons weren't safe from it. And when fired at infantry positions, its blast and shrapnel tore apart bunkers and anyone inside. But there was still room to make it better. Engineers kept tweaking it with bigger warheads, more propellant and optics, which led to the RPG-4. That one never went into full production, but it paved the way for the RPG-7, which finally solved all the earlier problems. It entered service in 1961 with the Soviet Army. And just for the record, when we say RPG stands for Rocket Propelled Grenade, that's actually the Western name. In Russian, it stands for, forgive my pronunciation, Ruchnoi Protivotankovi Granatomiot, which literally translates to handheld anti-tank grenade launcher. The more you know. So, what was so special about the RPG-7 that made it disturbingly effective and basically unfair to the most modern tanks? Well, let's start with its simplicity. The launcher tube is made from 3mm chrome-lined steel, so it won't rust, you don't really need to clean it, and it will most likely fire regardless. The launcher is not disposable, you can use it many times, you just load projectiles from the front. The rocket engages with a notch in the tube that locks it in place. The launcher tube is only 40 millimeters in diameter, but because the warhead's widest section extends outside the tube, the round doesn't have to fit completely inside it. That lets the launcher use a much larger caliber warhead while staying compact. Under the tube, you've got two handles, with the forward grip holding the cocking lever, trigger, and the safety. The launcher has a battery-powered sight for low light, and the optics reticle is graduated out to 1,000 meters. Now, that's mostly theoretical, because at 1,000 meters, you're not going to hit much other than a big building. It's more for area type or indirect aiming than precision shots. Real effective range is under about 300 meters. There are flip-up iron sights you can use if the optic is broken or if you simply don't have one. At the rear is a blast deflector cone, which matters because of the huge back blast the rocket makes. When you fire, you must have at least two meters of clear space behind you, and you really don't want the rear pointed at friendly troops, since the back blast can cause horrific injury or even kill someone if they're too close. 
When firing from an enclosed space like a room, you have to think about that seriously, because a nearby wall can reflect the blast and badly hurt or kill the shooter. The system was meant to be run by a two-man team, one shooter and one carrying extra rockets and helping reload. As for the warhead, this is where it gets interesting, because the RPG-7 isn't just for the anti-tank job. The heat warhead is the most common, and the reason the RPG-7 stayed feared. It works on the shaped charge principle, the Munro effect. That means inside the warhead nose is a cone-shaped cavity lined with a thin copper layer. When the explosive goes off, the cone focuses the blast into a very high-speed jet of metal particles, roughly 10 kilometers per second, that punches through armor by concentrating kinetic force on a tiny point. It could pierce about 260 millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor, which, when the round appeared in 1961, was more than enough to kill any tank in the world, even frontally. Once it gets through the armor, it spits molten metal and fragments all over the inside of the tank, and the effect on the men inside is horrific. It can easily ignite ammo and fuel and cause catastrophic secondary explosions. The heat warhead was also effective against fortifications since it could cut through a meter of reinforced concrete and was used in urban fighting to smash into strongholds with repeated hits. Then you have fragmentation and anti-personnel rounds. These don't carry a sustainer rocket, only an ejection booster, basically turning the RPG into a small mortar. But the real nightmare rounds are the thermobaric ones. On impact, a small charge disperses a fuel aerosol, and milliseconds later the main charge lights it up, creating massive overpressure and intense heat. That's devastating in enclosed spaces, where the pressure wave and heat do horrible things to the human body. Even in the open, the kill radius is roughly 10 meters, but indoors the effects are much worse. The blast eats oxygen and creates such heat that you die from the environment even if the shockwave doesn't finish you. Besides those, there are also specialized rounds like smoke and illumination. The firing sequence looks like this. At the tip of the warhead is a piezoelectric fuse covered by a plastic cap and safety pin that, if not removed, will keep the warhead from detonating. That actually happened in some fights where poorly trained paramilitary groups fired rockets with the safety still on, and duds landed harmlessly around their targets. When the safety is removed and the warhead tip strikes something, it detonates the charge. There's also a self-destruct mechanism set to go at 900 meters if the round doesn't hit anything. Though, because of bad storage and use by a lot of questionable groups, misfires were common. Either the warhead wouldn't detonate or it would blow up too early, sometimes tragically for the operator and anyone nearby. So, when you pull the trigger, the booster cartridge shoots the grenade out of the tube to about 11 meters, and then the main rocket motor kicks in. Stabilizing fins pop out once the round clears the tube to steady it in flight, and it flies at roughly 300 meters per second. So how did this weapon intended for the Soviet army reach such production numbers, spread all over the world, appear in virtually every conflict, and most importantly end up in the hands of some quote-unquote questionable organizations? Well, the RPG-7 entered service in 1961 with the Soviet army and at the same time began reaching allied countries. They soon saw action in Arab-Israeli fighting, where it proved what it could do to tanks. And then came the Vietnam War, where the Soviet Union supplied its communist allies in North Vietnam. Because it was cheap, easy to use, and very effective, it was exported in huge numbers. Around 9 million have been produced to date, and like the AK-47, it found its way onto black markets and into the hands of groups that should not have had it. Now, we won't get political about it, but you get the idea. The RPG-7 first made its name in Vietnam, where it was devastating in close-range ambushes with teams hiding in thick vegetation. They knocked out huge numbers of American vehicles like improvised gun trucks, patrol boats, helicopters, and even M48 Patton tanks. But that was just the beginning, because the RPG would go on to destroy multi-million dollar equipment that was thought untouchable by such a cheap, crude weapon. Improvised solutions came to protect armor from this incredibly simple but effective weapon. At first, it was enough just to add wood boards or even cardboard as improvised spaced armor to prematurely detonate the RPG away from the main armor, which reduced the shaped charge jet's effectiveness. Then the real answer came in the form of explosive reactive armor, or ERA, appearing in the 1970s as RPG threats became obvious. ERA is basically metal boxes with explosive behind a metal plate. When a shaped charge jet strikes the metal, the explosive blows the whole tile outward and physically disturbs the jet. At the same time, heavier applique armor was standardized, and so-called cage or slat armor became common. 
That worked for a while. Then, the cat and mouse game continued, and attackers beat these measures simply by increasing the volume of fire and sending several RPG teams to hit the same tank, especially at weaker spots like the sides, rear, or roof. Multiple hits would punch holes in ERA or cage armor, and eventually they would find a way through. They did not even need to destroy the tank completely. Immobilizing it or jamming the turret was enough to put it out of action and leave it for follow-up destruction. ERA was then countered by tandem charge warheads. These used a small precursor forward charge to set off the ERA tile and a main charge right behind it to hit the now exposed armor. Warheads also improved and could defeat up to 600 millimeters of armor. That aimed the next generation of systems like the RPG-29 squarely at that problem, with much more powerful warheads from the start. Still, the RPG-7 remains the most widely used system for knocking out even the best and most heavily armored tanks today, like the Abrams. For example, in the Iraq War, an M1 Abrams was hit 14 times by RPG-7 rounds. And while the armor prevented catastrophic penetration and an internal explosion, the tank's external systems were wrecked and the engine was destroyed, putting it out of action. RPGs are especially dangerous in urban combat, where they can strike from all angles and hit the weakest spots. That's how Russian armor was mauled in the First Chechen War, when columns rolled into Grozny and were met by dozens of RPG teams positioned on multiple levels of surrounding buildings, hammering T-72s from every direction. The Russians lost about 100 tanks and BMPs in a short time. Then the most modern solution came, one that still fails to protect tanks from a simple weapon designed 60 years ago, as we can see today in ongoing conflicts. Active protection systems. Now these come in two flavors, soft kill and hard kill. Soft kill means preventing the anti-tank weapon from hitting the tank by jamming its seeker or blinding its guidance. But that only works for weapons that have those features. RPG-7s have no seeker, they are aimed and fired directly without guidance, so active protection systems rely on the hard kill approach to intercept and physically disable incoming RPGs. Sensors detect the incoming projectile and fire a small counter munition to break or deflect the RPG warhead before it reaches the armor. These systems got a lot of development because people hoped they would finally solve the problem of a cheap weapon destroying an expensive tank, and some, like Israel's Trophy and Iron Fist, are among the best known. But here's the problem. These systems work, but not always. First, like all modern high-tech gear, sensors sometimes fail, and that happens with these systems too. Then you have the problem of hurting the crew or nearby infantry, so these systems usually don't operate when hatches are open, or they are disabled by the tank commander to avoid killing friendly soldiers following the tank. Again, we can see today in urban warfare even the most modern tanks like the Israeli Merkava, getting hammered at close range by RPG-7s, despite having all the latest protective features. The system carries a limited number of counter munition, and volleys of multiple RPGs can either exhaust it or overwhelm it if several are fired at the tank at the same time. And then, if everything mentioned before is not enough, the RPG-7 evolved in a quite unexpected way, at least its warhead did, when someone got the idea to strap it onto a drone and run it into enemy targets. We see in the conflict in Ukraine how drones became a major battlefield threat, not just for tanks but for infantry and everything in between. Now fiber optic controlled drones are immune to radio jamming countermeasures and can put the warhead exactly where they want it. And it's still more than effective because it doesn't rely on impact velocity but on a shaped charge. This leaves tanks without a reliable solution and crews desperately try to protect themselves with improvised armor that has reached absurd levels. Tanks get piled with anything crew could find to keep drones away, creating these so-called turtle tanks. But still swarms of drones find weak spots and keep destroying tanks across the battlefield with no effective counter to an old, cheap, widely available anti-tank weapon designed more than 60 years ago. 